what happened in Egypt, it wasn't a political outrage. The, the people were basically starving. You know, the inflation that's happened in food costs basically put, put food out of their ability to pay for it. You know, that's what I think really put them over the edge. In, in Egypt? Yeah, yeah, for example. And I think that in other countries as well, you know, like even in Israel, there's mass demonstrations and protests, you know, much bigger than ever before. Also not reported here. I mean, you really have to, to be searching a lot of news outlets to even know that those demonstrations are taking place in, in Israel. Yeah, and I think one of the big reasons why it's not happening in the United States is that the right, I don't know what the right is now, because the right seems to occupy the right, the left, and the center. You know, the right has been very successful at um, breaking down labor unions and other organizations where people come together and talk and create venues from which they can, you know, learn about things and also mobilize. There is great success in breaking that up. Look how, you know, relatively recently they destroyed ACORN. Were there problems within ACORN? Absolutely. Did it deserve to be destroyed wholesale? Absolutely not. And yet that's what happened. Yeah, yeah. So I think to begin to get at this, I think I'm going to try to do it by comparing economics to meteorology. Okay. Now, there's, there's a long-standing joke that really became big in the 1920s. And it went something like this. Why did God invent weather forecasting? And the answer that economists gave was it was to relieve us of our profound inferiority complexes. Uh, it was like, <laughs> even the, great, the greatest American economist of that time, Irving Fisher, he lost all his money in the Great Depression. He said it couldn't happen. You know, they were constantly, and their advice didn't work. Economics wasn't really working in terms of of prediction. But you see, back then, you know, computer modeling of weather systems didn't exist. So meteorologists were horrible at predicting the weather. Since then, though, although still far from perfect, meteorology has made great strides as a science, while economics, certainly if we could see, if we look at it and judge it by the state of the world's economy, is deteriorated markedly. I mean, everything is falling apart now. So you'd think that, you know, over this time, economics would have gotten better at preventing this. But now, you know, certainly since 2000, we have crash after crash. We've used up all of the traditional bullets that the Federal Reserve has used and the government has used to try to bolster the economy. They're all used, and we're right now going into what's probably going to be the worst economic collapse since the Great Depression. And I can tell you that right now, if it wasn't for the fact of how many people are paid through the government, through food stamps, SSI, unemployment insurance, et cetera, et cetera, we would be in much worse shape than we were during the Great Depression. So economic science has been a total failure. It's only through putting people on the dole that we even have a society that appears to be functioning. So what's the big difference between meteorology and economics? Because I think that'll help to give some idea of what's happened. And let's look at it with a, a two-part difference. The first difference stems from the fact that weather happens independently of human action in the short term. You know, we can do things to the environment and to the world that will affect the weather long term. But in the short term, there's not much that we can do. It's an environmental phenomenon that would exist in the absence of humans. The best that we can do is to track and predict it. Economics, on the other hand, is the science of human action under conditions of scarcity. With humans, past actions alone are insufficient to predict the future. In any moment in time, a person can have a new thought or emotion that will send them in a new unforeseen direction. In economics, the science itself also seeks to influence the future of that which it studies. You know, with the weather, we're not going out there and trying to change the weather. We're just trying to report it accurately. And, of course, there's a big difference if we're talking about environmental phenomena and human phenomena. So, you know, economics is trying to prescribe policies that profoundly affect our economic weather. And these policies, in turn, affect people's expectations, thoughts, emotions, and their actions, which further affects the economy. So that's the first big difference, you know, the... Um, the weather is an environmental phenomena, and the economics both tries to affect what's happening 
and it's involved with people. And the second difference has to do with the different relationship that government and business have with the datum and conclusions reached by the two sciences. You know, business and government want to have as accurate weather for forecasting as possible when it comes to local near-term forecasts. That's in, their effort, that's in their best interest. You know, if there's going to be a big storm, you want to predict for it. You don't want to have as massive damage as if there was no prediction. You couldn't prepare for it. The long-term prediction with the weather, on the other hand, as, as global warming controversy is made clear, science there has become a total political football. So in the field of meteorology, everyone is in favor of allowing both theory and practice to grow as the facts of the matter require. But just imagine for a moment how meteorology would have fared as a science if it had become practical to influence the weather. Huge farming corporations would lobby to have weather patterns bring more rain to their area. They would endow chairs in meteorology departments that would favor weather patterns that would benefit their growing season. Oh my goodness! I'm, you know, it's almost scary to hear that. Because maybe that will be that might come to pass someday, but we're certainly not there yet. Yeah, and of course, you know, and, and you know, there would be all of this back and forth between different competing farming areas, tourist hotspots that would be competing, and they would be pushing to get theories put forth that would best represent their needs. You know, meteorological scholarship that would include what was in the best interest of long-term environmental factors would fail to be pursued for lack of funding support. See, I mean, this is what happens and has happened in economics. Government and business have huge stakes in what statistics and policies are put forth. So, and that's why statistics are manipulated because they have a huge stake in what those statistics are. I mean, if you're a president coming up for re-election, you want the inflation and unemployment numbers as low as possible and the gross domestic product showing good growth to show what a great job you're doing. And as we'll see, you know, all administrations, whether Democrat or Republican, they manipulate the statistics, not only to make it appear they're doing a better job than they're doing, but also to further their social, political, and economic agendas. Yeah, and this has been going on. So economics is destroyed before it even had a chance to grow and to develop. You know, the businessmen and corporations, they have powerful agendas. They use their wealth and influence to endow chairs in the most influential universities with scholars who will promote economic theory that can justify policies that will serve their financial interests. They spend huge amounts both in campaign contributions and lobbyists to influence legislation and options that are up for public discussion. They provide grants to universities whose graduates will promote their agendas and further their interests. Those who challenge what become economic orthodoxy are strongly discouraged in their studies. So the actual development and growth of economics, it's still born before it even gets to move forward. The theory itself is totally, I'll make up a word, agendaized from the beginning. And you know, this explains why there are no economists for either party that they can call on to provide new solutions to the old problems. Everyone who has made it through the system has accepted an economics that has been deeply colored by agenda. Academia itself discourages honest economic investigation. Other than in relation to global warming, meteorology did not have such influences to prevent its growth as a science. Facts, truth, and science were left unimpeded to grow in service of accurate weather forecasts. So there's a huge difference between the two. And what this really shows is that now we have economic hard times not due to facts beyond our control, but because the public has ceded economics to the experts and authorities who are using bad science. It's no different than if I were to try and build a bridge. You know, I'm no engineer. Neither, knowing neither the principles nor the application of engineering, my bridge would fail. It would fail probably pretty quickly. If we undertake a project that, that doesn't conform to the laws of nature, then it's doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. Bad science leads to bad results. And this is what is going on. And I mean, in economics today, much of policy has nothing whatsoever to do with science. You know, the, those in power decide what they want to accomplish, and then they work to create a so-called economic justification to sell the policy to the public. When I was in doctoral program in economics, you know, I, I just was, I was dumbfounded. I was flabbergasted. I saw that the mathematical economics really was developed like this. First, an economist 
so-called economist, would have an idea of what he wanted to prove. And then he would create assumptions and mathematical formulas that would prove it. You know, it was backward. This is what I want to accomplish, so now how do I create the justification for it? And if you looked at the assumptions, they made no sense. And this, of course, sets the science up for being corrupted because if the science is based on having a, a theory that you then go out to find a way to prove, then if you're a, you know, the financial industry or if you're a government official looking to be reelected or to put through an agenda, you, you just assign an economist and say, prove this. Come back with proof for me so we can exactly. ram this I mean, thing through. It, it really works that way. And I think that, you know, a great, great example of this is the answer to the following question. And this is one that's been asked in the press recently. And, you know, their answers don't really hit the nail on the head as far as I'm concerned. And the question is, and it's one of the big questions of the day, why is this generation slated to be the first generation to have a lower standard of living than their parents? And this is, it's a real big question. Like, why is this happening? You know, this, this hasn't happened before. And to put this into context, we have to go and review a little bit of history again. You know, after World War II, I mean, the whole world w was in a mess. You know, you had Europe just totally destroyed. The United States was by far the biggest power and the biggest manufacturing center on planet Earth. You know, this was just a golden opportunity for business to grow and to make tons of money. They just had two huge problems. The government had huge war debts that needed to be paid. And there was need for a growing workforce, you know, to meet the needs of manufacturers for workers who also could afford to buy what was produced. Now today, you know, the United States would handle this, the first problem with this huge debt by inflating it away, you know, by creating money out of thin air. Back then, that was impossible. The United States was on the gold standard in relation to other countries, not in the way the United States citizens. Citizens could not redeem their dollars for gold but any foreign country could. So if the United States devalued the dollar in relation to gold, there would have been a big run sending these dollars back to the United States from foreign countries and requiring gold. So that was not an option. So the United States government and business, in order to take advantage of the huge opportunity that was before it, had to actually pay off the debt. And how did they do this? One thing they did to repay the debt and also they had to spend on recovery after the Great Depression and the war, was to create a thriving middle class and to pay the debt. And to do that required a huge investment within the United States government. And so they couldn't do it by spending money they didn't have, so they actually, and this sounds incredible today, they taxed corporations and individuals to help to pay for this, to make this investment. We're talking about, by the way, Eisenhower. We're not talking about Mao Zedong or, or Joseph Stalin. So we are talking about Truman and Eisenhower. I mean, we, we have to include Truman and even um, a little bit Roosevelt. But Eisenhower, during Eisenhower's administration, the tax rate on individuals, the marginal rate was raised to 91%. And that was on all income over $100,000. And back in those days, corporations paid 50% more taxes, and I'm talking about in total, than individuals. So if you add all corporate taxation and all taxation on individuals, corporations paid 50% more than individuals, and individuals had a, a marginal, the highest marginal tax rate was 91%. And by the way, these tax rates were voted in by both Democrats and Republicans. You see, back then, Republicans were true conservatives. They believed in paying their way, even when it meant higher taxes. 